The scariest thing about scuba diving is not sharks, jellyfishes, or barracudas, it's yourself. The damage you could do to yourself is far greater and frequent than any injury wildlife can ever inflict on you. For example, if you hold your breath at 10 meters and swim to the surface without exhaling, your lungs will double their volume due to the expansion of the air contained within them. Besides the mechanical rupture of your lungs, this can lead to all sorts of problems, including bubbles of air in your bloodstream. Terrifying! My name is AJ with Most Amazing, and these are the the top 10 dark things deep sea divers refuse to talk about. At number 10, meeting a Mako shark. All these stories, by the way, were posted on Reddit. This one is from you slash one dumb diver. I grew up in Oz when I was 15. I took the family boat out and drove myself down the reef to clear my head, which was mistake number one. I was down at a depth of 28 meters, 90 feet, when I was only rated for about 60 feet, mistake number two. Whilst diving, I spotted a 2.5 meter Mako shark coming right at me. For those who are unaware, Makos are basically the cheetahs of the ocean, and they only have two speeds. Curious, harmless and lunch, very much harmful. This guy was in lunch mode, so I hovered, as I'd been trained to do, as there would be no way for me to escape or outmaneuver it. Nowadays, we dive with shark shields, which emit electronic pulses that freak the sharks out and keep them away, but back then, what we used was essentially a chainmail sleeve. The idea being that sharks hate the taste of metal, so if you give it your arm, it'll bite down, decide you're gross, and move along. So I wait, and it comes, and I do a perfect move to give the beastie my arm. Just before the crunch, However, it occurred to me that I had left my sleeve on my bed. Mistake number three. I had my kelp blade drawn and I impaled it right as it bit me. It swam off and I was alive. However, I now had a series of problems. One, I had huge open gashing wounds on my arm from the bite in open water and it was trailing bodily fluids everywhere. Once the shock wore off, you realize that you're in salt water and salt on open wounds does not feel good. In a panic, I dropped my weight belt and shot up to the surface without any sort of waiting period which was mistake number four. Because I hadn't been paying attention to the currents, I was approximately a quarter mile downstream of my boat, which means I had to swim up to it. Mistake number five. When I got to the boat, I really started to wish I'd done as my dad had said and had the communications fixed. Mistake number six. Or that I had upgraded the first aid kit like I'd been wanting to do so. Number seven. So I end up racing back to shore with nothing but a tourniquet to staunch the bleeding. Long story short, my series of unfortunate self-inflicted events earned me 172 stitches, boatloads of physical therapy because the shark had actually bitten down on my tricep and detached it, and easily identifiable scars on one of my arms for the rest of my life. At number nine, she died instantly. Posted by you slash waboosh. I was diving with a mom, her husband, and their son on a night dive. I don't know how many dives they'd been on, but the mom, for some reason, decided to go up without signaling anybody why. She did the thumbs up, which is the signal, meaning that she needs to go up, and the dive instructor signaled back, asking why she just went up. So the guide is trying to get her to come back down when a boat comes across and runs her right over. It was a big dual motor. There was all kinds of bodily fluids everywhere, and we had to rush out because there was a lot of sharks in the area. She perished instantly, I assume. If you're enjoying the video so far, please support the channel by pressing like, subscribing to Most Amazing, and ringing the notification bell. At number eight, a jelly got stuck in my swim trunks, posted by you slash hohatu underscore. Nearly all of my dives have been excellent, with only a few moments being scary. However, during one dive, something happened that wasn't really scary in the way you might be thinking, but it was pretty bad for me. Put it short and bluntly, a moon jelly got stuck in my swim trunks. Its stingers were in contact with my upper thigh for nearly a minute. Probably less than that, but it felt like a long time. It was terrifying coming up from an excellent night dive only to feel a certain something float up into my swim trunks and continuously sting my leg. Seeing all the other moon jellies hovering in the water after seeing the thing was no fun either. Nor was getting back to the boat when I could barely move my leg. I had really bad marks on it for almost a week and walking was difficult. Thankfully, moon jellies are pretty harmless. Usually you brush up against them and it feels like a bee sting and you go on your way. Except this one felt like a really bad bee sting for an extended period of time that was dangerously close to my family jewels. At number seven, saved someone from drowning while scuba diving from you slash shark bite. A person had an epileptic seizure at 85 feet of water in a pitch black cavern I was diving in. I was hovering just above when I saw the flashlight move. I swam down and was met with other divers with no regulator in their mouth, their eyes open, just on their knees. The diver's buddy was next to them and in complete shock to what was going on. 15 years of diving instructor training came over me like it was second nature. I thought her regulator just came out, so I popped mine out and offered it to her, but then I noticed 
noticed that she had mentally checked out. I popped my regulator back in my mouth and attempted to put my number one regulator in hers, but her teeth were completely clenched. Then I pressed the purge button to get air into her mouth and noticed her cheeks were moving, so I know air is getting in there. That was good enough for me. I grabbed her under her arm and the regulator flowing in her mouth, and I swam to the opening of the cavern and then up over 60 feet to get her to the surface. As I'm towing her in, she's regurgitating all the water that she swallowed and inhaled, and it seems like gallons of water at this point. Got her to land where the other divers assisted me in getting all the gear off. The crazy thing is that she didn't tell anyone she had epilepsy, and when we were later reviewed her content on the form, she checked off no to epilepsy. I put myself at risk by shooting up to the surface like that, but if I came across that situation again, I would not hesitate to save someone's life. And number six, the blackfish. Here on the Brazilian coast, there's a fish that resembles a shark, but it's considerably smaller, called casau. You have to hunt these little guys at night because they're sort of nasty in the open, so it's easier to shoot them when they're in their coves. So my friend, let's call him Reggie, is about one kilometer from the coast, diving near a reef. This thing is massive, and you have to go really deep to get the slope on with the caves. Reggie said he had a feeling while descending that everything was off. The smaller fish were absent, there were no turtles, the water was murkier than usual. His partner stays back with the flashlight, and he gets closer to the reef. Reggie searches for the fish, but can't find any of the cackle he wants, so he takes kind of long, and after a certain point, he feels a shift in the water like something big is swimming near him, just as the weak light from his partner waves frantically and then turns off. He doesn't know what to expect, so he goes into fight or flight mode. Except he can't ascend too fast, so he tries to stay at the same level. Then he cocks his harpoon, and he waits. He waits and waits, but he doesn't see anything murky in the seawater, not even his partner's light. That had to mean one of two things. Either his partner went out of batteries, or he saw something and didn't want to attract its attention. Reggie finally decided to start ascending very slowly. The weird feeling got worse and turned into chills, and as he was going up, he felt that same shift again and did not hesitate to harpoon whatever it was, but he missed. He said he never saw something so big underwater, and it swam fast. Reggie couldn't make out much in the dark, like a proper shape or anything, but he noticed that the thing went deeper near the reef, so he tried to go up as fast as possible and make it up to the boat where his partner helped him up. Turns out his partner tried to warm him about it with the light because he saw something, quote, abnormally big swimming in this dangerous distance, but couldn't get to him because he felt like he was washed by the thing. They both called it the blackfish since they couldn't really see what it was. It was said to be as big as a man, about 1.7 meters. At number five, the Moray Dragon. Oh god. An old WW2 ammunition ship off the south coast, England, was full of brass topped with shells. This pile of shiny brass metals was miraculously untouched and remarkably clean after spending years underwater. Out of the murky darkness, the largest moray I have ever seen snakes forward without exaggeration. This thing had a head the same size as a horse's head full of jagged teeth. I couldn't see the body as it was looped into the dark and deeper into the ship. No one got near those shells. As it turns out, for years this thing's been guarding these shiny brass shells slithering over them making them shine. We found out at the bar later that he was famous in the area and many people went to the wreck just to see him. No idea why this giant creature was guarding them like a dragon and its horde, but some said that morays are like magpies and like shiny things. At number four, don't free dive alone by you slash bantam mode. When you're free diving, you come up slowly more to conserve energy and air. You haven't breathed compressed air, so you haven't taken on much nitrogen. Repetitive deep free divers can get bent, but it's pretty rare. You can come up as fast as you like, but the 10 meter to the surface pressure gradient is high, so you have to be super careful. And if you don't have enough O2 in your bloodstream, when you come up, sometimes your alveoli can rob O2 out of your bloodstream to keep the right lung balance and make you pass out. I did have one scary incident where I should have probably perished, and this is the don't free dive alone, folks. Warning. I was down at 20 meters taking photos of an octopus alone. I was probably down there for two minutes or so and maybe overstayed my welcome. I started to ascend, but the panic really hit, and stupidly, rather than letting the buoyancy take me home, I gave in and started fitting hard. Fatal mistake. This starts to use up large quantities of stored oxygen in your blood, and thus you become depleted. When I got to about 6 meters, I remember feeling lovely and warm, like the sea was giving me a warm blanket hug. My wetsuit felt lovely, and I felt frizzy, and the next thing I remember is fitting out at the surface and shaking. I was fitting, trying to keep my head above water, and eventually laid on my back and floated. I had passed out at 6 meters, and the wind had resuscitated me when I got to the surface. If it hadn't been windy, I most likely would have been dead as the wind told my lips and the receptors that I was above the surface, which is why you're taught to blow on people's lips and faces to bring them back around as free divers. At number three is bad air. I was 18 meters down when my air went bad. It had a weird metallic surgery taste to it and I started losing consciousness. I pointed myself up and pulled on my BCD, 
which is buoyancy compressor, and about six meters from the surface, I blacked out. When I woke up, I was being hauled into the dive boat, I blew both my eardrums, and I haven't been able to dive since. I got very freaking lucky, I could have drowned. At number two, picked up a venomous hitchhiker. Diving the day before a hurricane on the small South Pacific island, when out of nowhere, a black and white sea snake, which was venomous, wrapped itself around my arm. Apparently this happens from time to time and before major storms. They can sense it and look for things that are heading towards the shore so that they don't have to put in so much effort to get out of the sea. As soon as I was in the shallows, it uncurled and headed up the beach where it hid under a breadfruit tree. At number one, the undeniable feeling of absolute dread. I'm in the Atlantic. Depth is about 30 to 50 feet with a lot of pocket reefs around. I swim away from a reef to see what's in that direction. Visibility about 40 feet. In front of me, at the surface, right at the edge of visibility, I see a massive body. What I can see is around 2 to 3 feet thick, about 6 to 10 feet long. I can only see a body and I can't see a tail or a head. It's a light silver with something darker or golden brown stripes. It was only there for a second and it must have been turning to go the other direction and I only saw part of its body. I had never seen anything like that. I was curious and intrigued. I started to swim towards it to see what it was. I got right about 12 feet in that direction when a fright came through my entire body. It was a primal, undeniable feeling of absolute dread and horror. My body was telling me that whatever that thing was, I needed to get the hell out of the water as fast as I could. I stopped swimming towards it and immediately pivoted back towards the boat. I swam on my back so I could keep looking behind me in the direction that thing had been. I don't know what that thing was, but it was massive. It was a giant and I was a fly. Some part of my animal brain knew what it was and knew that it was a danger. As always, if if there is a dark thing that deep sea divers refuse to talk about that you think I missed, feel free to let me know down in the comments. I've been AJ with Most Amazing, and I'll catch you all in another video. Later.